Well, welcome to the month of May. Here we are at it again uh, online. I certainly pray that uh, that you're well. I hope you're all doing fine. And um, and I know that uh, there is this longing in many of our hearts to to get back to normal, a longing to be with family, with friends, and to be with your brothers and sisters at church um, as well. Uh, but we still need to be patient, although there is some good news that appears to be on the horizon. I don't want to get ahead of that, but uh, the bishops uh, did meet uh, this past week and decided for the next three Sundays that we're still going to suspend service. That does not mean that on the fourth Sunday, we're going to fire it all back. They're going to they're going to uh, meet again and uh, reassess the whole situation as they've been doing on a regular three or four week basis. So, so where our services, this is still I'm afraid the status quo, this is how uh, we'll be connecting with each other and worshiping uh, with each other uh, each and every week uh, until such a time as it's safe. Now, there is some good news that we seem to see in the media that things are, you know, a little bit of light there that I think tomorrow even on Monday uh, that there will be some businesses that will be inching very slowly uh, toward normalcy. So that's uh, that's a good sign. I want to caution you that as far as we're concerned, um, we, of course, are going to follow uh, whatever government guidelines or recommendations are are handed to us. We're going to follow them. Uh, but uh, I don't think that our return will necessarily be a full-on Sunday, everyone's back. We'll have to wait and see as to whether or not that's that's even possible. But I, I suspect that our return back will be a gradual thing, uh, depending on what the limitations are for group gatherings and whatnot. And we'll also, um, we're also thinking about how we're going to uh, do the Sunday service in in a way that's that's safe for people, uh, that's comfortable for people as well. Because I know that uh, that some of us are not going to just you know go right out into the in, into the community again, uh, just uh, just because there's this say so that that we can. But there's there's still some fear, some caution, and especially among our elderly people that they'll want to be as cautious as possible in returning. So long story short is is our our return will likely be gradual. If it's if it's not, then that's great. But I think it will likely be gradual. So your executive council uh, is meeting uh, to talk about about strategies for coming back and what sorts of things that that will look like. And there's all kinds of things that we have to take into account. Everything from from the bathrooms to to the distribution of the Eucharist. Should we have Eucharist right away? Also, um, the social distancing if that can be maintained if it's required. And uh, and uh, and the exchange between services. There's time between services, uh, between congregations. So what's going to happen in terms of, of cleanup or whatever then? So those things will be discussed. They'll be taken care of. Our main and primary concern is your health and safety and that uh, that you are safe and protected uh, and assured when you when you return uh, to, to church and to our, our community service, our worship service on Sundays. So, so those are the things to bear in mind. A couple of different things with our service this morning. I'll be quick. Uh, we do have a reader. Uh, we tried a Zoom thing of recording a uh, reader for Zoom. We may have difficulties with that in the future because of people's uh, quality of microphone that they have on their computer. We're going to give it a couple more shots, and then maybe there's some other way that we can possibly fix it or or, or make it better. So, uh, But Xandra is doing the first reading. You'll hear it. You'll hear what it sounds like, and I think it sounds okay. Uh, in, well, her reading is great, but I think that in terms of technical quality, it it, it sounds okay. It's not the best, but uh, but I think uh, I think it's great. The second thing is is that we have uh, introduced service uh, music uh, to the service at the beginning and at the end. So the processional and the recessional uh, songs are are back. Uh, Jamie's not doing them. He's not. Uh, he's still recovering. He's still resting and and whatnot. He's okay, but uh, but he's still kind of restricting his work a bit until he's he's right back up uh, on his energy. So we have Phil uh, has has sent me. Uh, a whole slew of of songs with lyrics uh, that uh, that we'll use uh, in the services coming, uh, you know, in the services coming up in the future, and uh, starting starting today. So, I think that's about it. Uh, I really pray that you're doing well. I pray that you're um, 
that you're that that you're comfortable, that you're finding uh, the things that you need, that you're finding uh, time to be close to the people who are with you, who are in isolation with you, and that you're especially finding time uh, in the Word and time to get really close uh, with Jesus at this particular time in our history. So, so good faith and and good health, and uh, know that you're in our prayers. And uh, just a couple of seconds of silence, then the music will begin. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Let us pray this together. Call it for purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and all the prophets. Lord, Lord have, have mercy on us and, and write all, all these laws in our hearts. hearts. Now let us pray the call it together for the fourth Sunday of Easter. O God, o God, whose Son, Jesus, Jesus Christ, is the shepherd, shepherd of your people, grant that when we hear his voice, we may know him who calls us each by name, and follow where he leads, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God forever and ever. Amen. 
A reading from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. This is the word of the Lord. Our appointed psalm for the day is Psalm number 23. We shall read it responsively, verse by verse. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And together. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John, chapter 10, beginning at verse 1. Truly, truly, I say to you, He who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be pleasing to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, we're continuing our study of First Peter. We've uh, gone through uh, 
most of chapter one in the past couple of weeks. And you may recall that uh, Peter is writing to a scattered church. They are in isolated patches throughout Asia Minor and they're suffering. They're, they're being persecuted. And right from the very beginning, Peter tries to centralize their thinking by reminding them of the central reason why they're together, why they're apart, why they're scattered, why they're suffering. And that is because of Jesus Christ. Remember, God's mercy leads to rebirth, which leads to hope, which leads to resurrected life. So that's the sequence at, at, at the beginning of, of First Peter. So Peter explains all of this, and then he goes on, and he talks about that particular promise and how it is um, imperishable, it's uh, undefiled, it's uh, unfading, it will not be tarnished, not a word will be taken away from it. And he goes on to talk about how, really, that promise, because it's from God, really holds its water, that it's not going to weaken, it's not going to loosen, and it's not going to disappear. And the hope is that we're, we'll end up the same way, that we will be untouched by death, that we will be unstained by evil, and that in the last days we too will not fade away, but remain in eternal life. So that hope is what sustains the suffering church. That's what Peter says. Then he goes on to emphasize what the result of that should be in our life, that if we're a saved people, then we should live like saved people. And we talked last week about how uh, what one hopes for determines how they live. Right. So if you if you're hope for a new car, then how you live and how you save your money will aim toward that hope. So we talked a little bit about last that last week about how all your thoughts, all your actions, all your feelings, your entire life should be wrapped around this hope. Your life should be shaped by the hope of the gospel. He calls the church, if you remember, uh, to keep their eyes fixed on this hope, to keep a loose grip on the world, but a tight grip on the gospel of Jesus Christ on the world to come. He wants Christians to anchor themselves in this sure hope. and He wants you to anchor yourself in this sure hope too. And he emphasizes, so far, right living. So that's what he's talking about. Right now, so far in this text, in chapter 1, he talks about how the church will behave. He talks about the church's morality and how the church is really should behave as if it were a metaphor for the kingdom. That as the church lives out its life, its salvation life, then it should reflect kingdom life. So, so far, Peter has been, take, uh, Peter has been speaking in, in moral terms, in church ethics, that church ethics should reflect kingdom principles. Now, in this section, he talks about a little bit about the hows, and he diverts a lot. Peter kind of brings up something and then he diverts and then he comes back to it and so he kind of expands and then and then goes on but we're going to we're going to focus on on I think what Peter's focus is in in our reading this morning chapter uh 2 of first Peter chapter 2 verses verses 1 to 12 but we're going to focus specifically on verses 2 to 5 verses 2 to 5 Peter wants the suffering church to go deeper in its spirituality so how do we maintain this kingdom life in our suffering? How do we survive? How does our faith survive through this suffering as we attempt to live a life of love, a life prepared to love, a life of, of expressing the gospel? And Peter wants the church to, to go deeper spiritually. He doesn't, want, he doesn't want the church to devote itself on meaningless, worldly, temporary, perishable things. He wants the church to focus itself on the kingdom of God, on their salvation, and on their spirituality. So we have the morality, and now Peter moves into the spirituality of the church. His answer to the question, how do we develop these these skills, how do we sustain this high standard of living, is quite simple, and it's spiritual development, spiritual growth. He wants the church to grow spiritually as it lives out its life in isolation and as it lives out its life in suffering. So let me read those verses to you and then we'll get into them. Beginning of verse 2. Like newborn infants, long for pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, then you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God and through Jesus Christ. 
So let's talk a bit about spiritual growth as, um, as Peter sees it. Uh, first of all, he talks about spiritual milk. Now, in other passages, uh, Paul mentions spiritual milk as well. He talks about milk, but he talks about it as, as in baby food. In Hebrews 15, uh, he says, For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. He is still a child. And in 1 Corinthians, he says, I fed you milk, not solid food. You are not ready for solid food. So, so when we get this sense of milk in, in, Paul's, in Paul's context, we get this sense of baby food. But that's not what Peter is addressing here. Peter is simply saying, Spiritual milk is the word of God. And his emphasis is not necessarily on the spiritual milk as much as it is on the craving. He wants the church, he wants the suffering church to crave for spiritual food, to crave for the word of God, to crave for the gospel in the same way a newborn infant just instinctively craves for its mother's milk. There needs to be this instinctive hunger for the gospel, this distinctive hunger for the word of God. And Peter says that the suffering church should persistently desire this word of God like a newborn baby instinctively craves its mother's milk. The word of God, according to Peter, is what nurtures our spiritual life. It is the only food that properly nurtures nurtures our spirits for a holy life. Our spirits cannot be fed by worldly passions. Our spirits cannot be fed by uh, worldly philosophies. Our spirits, as the church, and living in a salvation life, our spirits can only be nourished by the Word of God. And Peter says that Peter Peter says the Word of God is is not just Scripture, but also. Christ. Christ is the is the living word of God, the living stone, and, and, and we'll get to that. We'll get to that in a moment. So in ver- in verse one of chapter two, uh, Peter says, you know, put away all malice. He says, uh, put away all hypocrisy, all deceit, all envy, and all slander. And these are the things that take us over when we do not hunger the word of God. These are the things that take us over when we have our minds fixed on other things, on more worldly things. So Peter is saying, get a grip on your hunger, get a grip on the gospel, hunger for it, and almost virtually to the point to the point of, of, of starving for it, right? Now this is not the means by which the church is called to be holy, right? It is a response to the call to be holy. Right? It is answering the call, the result of the call. See, Peter says not everyone is going to drink this milk and is going to find it good and tasty. Not everyone is going to do that. Someone's going to, someone's going to read this gospel and think of it sour. And he says that, that later on in, in verse 8, he says that it's a stumbling block, block for many people because their minds are not, are not around, um, are not beyond their, 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 their own nature. So they think of themselves as, you know, as it's impossible that I'm born with sin or filled with sin. I'm a pretty good person. Uh, but, but the gospel message tells us exactly the opposite of what we naturally think about ourselves. And so for some people, right, who do not come to Jesus, right, this gospel is not tasty at all. As a matter of fact, it's offensive to them. And there's there's plenty of, of, of text in the New Testament that points us in that direction. The Word of God is the means by which we come to to Jesus. Let's get to that in verse 4. It says, as you come to him, as you come to Jesus. Now I want us to to think about that word come because in the Greek it's a continuous process. So Peter is not talking about the first moment you give yourself to Christ. He's not talking about that moment of conversion and then you're, you're, you're set free. It's a continual coming to Christ, a continual nurturing of the soul, a daily nurturing of the soul and he says that as you continually come to him and then he describes jesus as the living stone rejected by men you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house so we've got spiritual milk and now we have a spiritual house and what is that concept that peter is trying to drive home to us well, he quotes, uh, he cites, in, as a way of expanding this, in verse 8, he cites uh, Isaiah uh, chapter 28. So let's go back to Isaiah chapter 28 and figure out exactly what, uh, what Peter means when he calls Jesus a living stone. 
Uh, back in Isaiah chapter 28, uh, judgment is about to come on Ephraim and Jerusalem. Uh, they're priests, they're politicians, they're drunkards, they're, they're scoffers, they reject the word of God. They made a deal, actually, some sort of covenant with Egypt, and that with, with the Assyrians attack, because that was the expectation that the Assyrians were going to attack. So they made a deal with the Egyptians, expecting that the Egyptians would save them, would, would, would give them life out, out, out of this attack. And, uh, and God calls this the covenant of death. And he says that in a few verses after, after the quotation. So he calls this a covenant of death. And you might say that the Israelites and their leaders and their priests who are drunkards and scoffers, that they have somewhat weaned themselves off of the spiritual milk that they've weaned themselves off of the word of God and they've put their faith and they put their trust in men. But God says in Isaiah 28, he says that he is the tested stone. His righteousness, his justice, and his mercy are the tested stone. That is the solid foundation that's going to see Jerusalem through the Assyrian attack. Not the Egyptians, not anything by man's power, but only the power of God's righteousness and God's mercy and God's justice. Right? And he says that is a tested stone. He says that is the foundation on which you will stand through this ordeal with the Assyrians. You will stand on this rock which is the righteousness of God. And sure enough, um, uh, well, he says that, uh, that all things are measured by this righteousness, everything. The whole world is measured by the righteousness, the judgment, the mercy of God. The whole world is measured by that. And of course, in the end, the tested stone survives. Jerusalem is okay. Angels come in the middle of the night and assist Jerusalem. And, uh, and Assyria does not completely destroy the city or Ephraim for that matter. So Peter draws this line between that living stone and he draws it right through the centuries now to Jesus. And he says, Jesus is the living stone. That in the same way that Israel rejected that stone uh, in the past, People are going to reject Jesus now, but he is still the living stone. He is the embodiment of God's righteousness. He is the embodiment of God's justice. He is the embodiment of God's mercy and God's love. He is God's word incarnate. He is now God's word incarnate. And he is now the stone upon which we stand. So we continually come to him because he is the foundation, the immovable foundation that will get us through our distress. Whatever your war is, whether you're fighting loneliness in this uh, in this epidemic or pandemic, if you're fighting disease, if you're fighting uh, bad relationships, whatever it is, Jesus is still the rock upon which you will stand because God's mercy causes us to be reborn, which gives us this hope. This hope is of the resurrection and a new life. That does not change. This is the living stone upon which the rest of the church is built. Because not only does that living stone connect you to Jesus by your faith, but it also connects us to one another. It connects us together. Because right? we are stones now, each one of us a stone, but one being built on top of the other right, into a spiritual edifice, a spiritual house. A single stone does not a house make. Right? So the church is a collection, a community of people. right? And remember, Peter's writing to the scattered church. right? So no matter where you are, you have this connection with one another through the living foundation, the living stone, who is Jesus Christ, the righteousness, the justice, and the mercy of God. Right? A spiritual edifice, a spiritual house, a spiritual temple now, where God meets with his people. But not only is that, is that a temple where God meets with his people, but the church is also a temple in terms of sacrifice. So let's talk about that for a bit. So uh, we go on that uh, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house that is by your faith in Christ. We're all connected together. We're all part of that house. To be a holy priesthood, we'll get to that, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus 
Christ. Spiritual, oh, we have spiritual milk, spiritual house, spiritual sacrifices. Peter switches metaphors to make a point. He's talking about stones and building blocks, if you will. And now he's talking about uh, the holy priesthood. Now, the priesthood is a very was very special in 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 the Jewish faith and in the Jewish context. Only priests were consecrated in the spirit. Listen to this. Only priests had direct access to God. Only priests represented God before men. Only priests could be bring men before God, and only priests could make sacrifices in the holy of holies in the presence of God. Those are spiritual sacrifice. Those were physical sacrifices. They would bring an animal and sacri- physically sacrifice an animal. But what's, what the spiritual house now does with Jesus is we make spiritual sacrifices because, because Christ is the ultimate bodily sacrifice on our behalf. So our sins are forgiven through Christ, but we're still called to sacrifice, to make spiritual sacrifices. Here Peter is saying that as a spiritual house, as a living stone of the spiritual house, you now... You are part of the priesthood. That is, you have all the rights that the priests had in the temple. That is to say, you are now consecrated in the Spirit. You have direct access to God. You represent God before people, and you can bring people to God. These are the products of spiritual sacrifices, that as a priesthood we're able to make these specific sacrifices. What are the spiritual sacrifices? Well, we make spiritual sacrifices, first of all, when we commit our lives to Christ, when we continually come to him and we commit ourselves to Christ and we say, Lord, I'm, I'm failing at this. My, my life is a mess. Uh, I, 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 I think I'm happy, but for some reason I'm not. And, and it, it, it just, I'm just going to give it all to you. And, and you just take over. And so you, you're, you're dead to yourself. You're, you're dead to sin. And that's, that's, that's the sacrifice that you make. That's the ultimate sacrifice that we make as believers as we pick up our cross and we're, we're, we're dead to ourselves. We no longer live for ourselves, right, says Paul, but, but we live for Christ who is within us. And, and that's, that's the ultimate spiritual sacrifice that we can make. The word offer here is a priestly term, and it actually means an act of worship. So worship is a way of spiritual sacrifice as well. And if we go back in the prayer book, actually, in the long form of the Eucharistic prayer, we'll find these words, and we earnestly desire your fatherly goodness, mercifully to accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And then later on you'll hear, and here... We offer and present to you, O Lord, ourselves, our souls, and our bodies to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice. So a spiritual sacrifice is a giving of yourself, your life, your possessions, your thoughts, your heart, your mind, just giving it all to Jesus and dying to those earthly desires that you may have. So we have spiritual milk, we have spiritual health, and we have spiritual sacrifice. And this is the, these are the, the network, if you will, the framework upon which we grow spiritually. Spiritual growth happens when we partake of the spiritual milk, when we, um, we remember and participate in the spiritual house, and when we make spiritual sacrifices that are pleasing to God. So what do we do about this? Um, what does that mean in terms of our, our day-to-day life? What can you do while you're in isolation at home? What can you do with this? Well, first of all, just drink up the gospel. Open your Bible and drink up the word of God. Your spirit already craves that diet. You may not know it, but as a believer, your spirit craves that diet because that's the only, only food that your spirit is able to take in and be nurtured by As a follower of Jesus, there is no other food that sustains you. There is no other food that edifies you. No other food that enriches or energizes your spiritual growth than the Word of God. The whole Word of God. The Gospel according to Genesis and the Gospel according to Revelation. The whole Word of God is necessary for your spiritual growth. Hunger for the Gospel like it was your favorite meal 
after 40 days of fasting. Hunger for the gospel as if it's your favorite meal after 40 days of fasting. So drink up the gospel. Number two, don't let loneliness overcome you. Remember that that you're not alone, that you're part of this bigger edifice that 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 that, that we're connected to in a holy and 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 sacred way. That we're connected to one another through Jesus Christ, through our Holy Savior, who we come to right, on a daily basis, who who we come to, and we are thereby connected to one another, part of that spiritual house. See, some Christians think that 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 they can be a Christian and then not participate in church or not participate in prayer, that as long as they have that faith, but that's not what the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us that we are built up together, that we are to teach one another, that we're to admonish one another, that we're to nurture one another, that we're to enrich one another, that we're to love one another. And it's not a Christianity is not an isolated faith. It's not something that you that you just kind of trap inside and hang on to it for, for the rest of your life and, 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 and not go to church or not be part of part of God's community, but God actually calls us, right? Even from the beginning, he calls Israel to be a holy nation together, a collection of people under him. And that's what the church is, is we're all a collection of people under Jesus, called to serve one another and to love one another. Now, technology will help us in that, even in our times of isolation. I mean, we're doing that right now. We're sacrificing ourselves in worship at this very minute for God. We're doing it electronically. Not the same thing as meeting in the flesh, that's for certain. But we're doing what we can to maintain our connection with one another because that's what we're called to do. Even a telephone call will help. Even a prayer, just pray together with someone over the phone. Just remember to to connect because you're not alone in this. You're not alone in this. And number three, make the kinds of sacrifices that please God. Make the kinds of sacrifices that please God. Now, if you're wondering, well, gee, Jim, what kind of sacrifices please God, there's a whole whack of them in uh, Hebrews chapter chapter 13, right? Under the sacrifices pleasing to God. This is what the writer of Hebrews says. These are some sacrifices that you can make, right, that are pleasing to God. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. Let marriage be held in honor among all. Keep your life free from the love of money. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Jesus lived outside the camp. He lived outside the camp. He lived, he lived, he lived outside the camp and he died outside the city. And the author of Hebrews is saying that you too just live outside the camp with Jesus. Offer up sacrifices of praise. You can do that anytime, anywhere. You can do that now. We are doing it now. And do not neglect to do good and to share what you have. And he concludes, for such sacrifices, all these things, such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So nurture your spirit on the only food that will strengthen it. And that is the gospel, the word of God, Jesus Christ. Remember that the living stone, Jesus, is indestructible. He is the rock upon which you stand even now. He connects us together and he brings us together and makes simple sacrifices for others. Simple sacrifices for others because those simple sacrifices are pleasing to God. Amen. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe believe in God, God, the Father Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the church and the world, saying, Hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world, and for the well-being and unity of the people of God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Foley, our Archbishop, and Charlie, our Bishop, Jim, our Priest, Jasmine, our Deacon, and Matthew, our Postulant, and for all the clergy and people of our Diocese. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service, especially Justin, our Prime Minister, Doug, our Premier, all Niagara Municipal Mayors and Regional Council. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, especially those who we recall in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection, especially for Bill, Terry, Debbie, Pat, and Wayne, in thanksgiving, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Most loving Father, you will us to give thanks for all things, to dread nothing but the loss of you, and to cast all our care on the one who cares for us. Preserve us from faithless fears and worldly anxieties, and grant that no clouds of this mortal life may hide from us the light of that love which is immortal, and which you have manifested unto us in your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, let us confess our sins to Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised the forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Let us pray together. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us your peace. Now the prayer for spiritual communion, a prayer of our desire to meet around the Lord's table and to share in the bread and wine. And this is a prayer that we pray until such a time that we're able to do that again. So let's pray this prayer together. 
Dear Jesus, I love, I love you above, above all things, and I desire to possess you within my soul. And since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, I beseech you to come spiritually into my heart. I unite myself to you, together with all your faithful people, and I embrace you with all the affections of my soul. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. And now, as our Savior has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now the doxology together. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the Church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Now go forth in peace to love and to serve our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.